a life filled with purpose, integrity, and selfless commitment to those around him. He had such a genuine impact on my life and the lives of so many others. From a young age, Lewis held himself to a standard of excellence. Upon graduation, from high school, Lewis enlisted in the U.S. Navy Reserve and was selected to join the prestigious V-12 Navy College Training Program during World War II and thereafter. Through this program, he attended Millsaps College and Tulane University and went on to serve in the Navy aboard the USS Mississippi. After serving, Lewis continued his education at the University of Alabama where he received a law degree and soon after commissioned as a first lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force in 1951 serving as a legal officer in Korea. Lewis Odom's career of service was only just beginning when he left the military. His hard work and integrity as a lawyer were recognized as he became the general counsel of the U.S. Senate Small Business Committee. He would go on to serve as administrative assistant to Alabama Senator John Spartman before being named staff director and counsel for the Senate Banking Committee. He played a critical role in shaping many of our nation's financial regulations during this important time period. Probably one of his most memorable accomplishments during his career on Capitol Hill was to plan and organize the inauguration ceremony for President John F. Kennedy. He often spoke of the great challenge and honor of that job. Following his time on Capitol Hill, he served as deputy to the chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC. He was eventually appointed senior deputy comptroller of the currency before retiring from federal service in 1981. After his years of service in the federal government, Lewis returned to practice law in Mobile, joining the law firm of Miller, Hamilton, Snyder, and Odom. This was when I met Lewis. As a newly minted lawyer, Lewis took me under his wing and served as an important mentor. Lewis was a thorough and exact lawyer who paid attention to detail and helped instill those traits in me and many others that he worked with. He inspired in me the confidence to hold myself to a standard of excellence, but he did so without being overbearing or harsh. He took a new lawyer and allowed me to gain invaluable experience. As a young lawyer, Lewis taught me an important lesson that every young lawyer must learn, to choose your battles wisely. This lesson applied to more than just the field of law, however, and I've continued to use this principle and many of the other skills that I learned from Lewis throughout my life and career. Lewis was also a true community leader, committed to making Alabama a better place. From his first days in Mobile to his last, Lewis was ever present in the community, serving in any way he could, always giving his time and his devotion. During his years in Mobile, Lewis served as the chairman of the Alabama Ethics Commission, the chairman of the Mobile Water Board, chancellor of the Episcopal Diocese of the Central Gulf Coast, and chairman of the Mobile Museum Board. He was also a strong supporter of the University of Alabama, serving as president of various alumni chapters and as a founding member of the Farrell Law Society for the University of Alabama Law School. It's true that Lewis worked just as hard for his community in his retirement as he had earlier in his legal career. Sadly, Lewis Odom passed away on January 16th of this year at the age of 91. My wife Rebecca and I were both heartbroken to learn of this passing because he was such a dear friend. During this time of sadness, we take great comfort in remembering the impact he had on each of us, as well as on our community, state, and country. I hope his wife, Janelle, son, Mike, daughter, Patty, beloved grandchildren and great-grandchildren can take comfort in the same. Mr. Speaker, Lewis was a man of great integrity and set an example for all those around him to hold ourselves to such a level of excellence and service. He was a great man and he will be sorely missed. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask you. Unanimous consent to revise and extend. Objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise out of deep concern for our country, our people, and those who serve us in uniform. The executive order signed by President Trump on Friday has not only shown chaos and created a backlash being felt across the world, it is also endangering our people here at home and our troops overseas. 
It bans refugees and is, for all intents and purposes, a ban on Muslims entering our country. It is a religious test. It plays right into the hands of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other extremist groups that mean to do us harm. It arms them. Their message in recruiting and propaganda has been that America is at war with Islam. And that when we say we are tolerant and inclusive, it is a lie. We must not let it be a lie. Make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, this order will do nothing to make America safer from terrorism. Our enemies will use this Muslim ban to their full advantage, broadcast to all those who, for whatever reason, may be teetering on the edge of extremism, one image, one tweet, one excuse away from radicalization. And our Muslim allies are scratching their heads in disbelief and disappointment. CBS News reported this morning, Mr. Speaker, that a senior Iraqi general who commands the elite counterterrorism force trained by the United States military was supposed to come here next week, but is now banned from doing so. He told CBS News, and I quote, I am a four-star general. I have been fighting terrorism for 13 years and winning. Now my kids are asking me if I'm a terrorist. That general, Talib al kanani has been coming here for over a decade meeting with senior U.S. military leaders at CENTCOM. But now he is banned from entering the country. This policy is dangerous, counterproductive, and extremely unfortunate. It is important to note, Mr. Speaker, that of the seven countries included in this ban, hear me, my colleagues, of the seven countries included in this ban, no refugee or immigrant from any of those nations has committed a terrorist act in the United States. The President of the United States has a responsibility, a sacred and public trust, to do everything in his power to protect our nation. We have that same responsibility. This Congress has a sacred duty to hold the President accountable and ourselves, how, for doing so in a way that respects our Constitution and our values. That, Mr. Speaker, is patriotism. So I urge my colleagues on both sides, stand against this order. Stand up for America. Stand up for the Constitution. Stand up for our values. Stand against an act that does nothing but empower our enemies and erode faith in our highest principles and in our country around the world. The nation, Mr. Speaker, is watching. The world, Mr. Speaker, is watching. I urge us to action. Representative Lofgren and Conyers have introduced a bill to block this executive order. I've co-sponsored it, along with 160 other members of this House. This is a time when party should not be put before country. Party should not be put before patriotism. Party should not be put before principle. Join me, colleagues, 
and let us deny our enemies this potent tool and remind the world what truly makes America great. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak about the unsung heroes in many communities throughout America. Certainly many rural communities are volunteer firefighters. These dedicated volunteers answer the call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They spend time away from their families and homes. The training that is required can be costly and very time consuming. Our volunteer firefighters make these sacrifices because they care deeply about their friends and neighbors. They care about their communities. But rural America is facing a real problem with dwindling numbers of those who are willing to volunteer. A National Fire Protection Association report published last year shows the number of volunteer firefighters per 1,000 people have been decreasing since 1986. Gone are the days when those seeking to volunteer had to add their names to a waiting list to join their local fire department. Sometimes volunteers could wait for years to be added to the roster, but that's not how it is anymore as fewer individuals are interested in signing up. Now this is not unique to Pennsylvania, but it is happening in communities across the country. But small communities reap the benefits of having volunteer forces. According to a 2016 National Fire Prevention Association study, the time donated by volunteer firefighters saves localities across the country an estimated $139.8 billion a year. The savings are clear and the service could not be more important. That's why last year I hosted two fire summits in my district to speak directly, one, uh, directly with local firefighters and try to identify not only the challenges that they face, but also some solutions to those problems. Funding is always a problem that plagues volunteer departments, and it can, be, it can truly decline quickly when we think of what it costs to purchase new equipment and be compliant with the latest regulations. Small communities are often already stressed economically and do not have a tax base that can assume another increase. But equipment replacement is paramount and it can sometimes mean the life or death of a firefighter. Volunteer fire departments also face training challenges. Firefighters in rural communities regularly need to travel long distances for instructional courses and paying for the necessary training can be difficult. Training sessions might not focus enough on firefighting in rural communities, which is different from that in urban communities in a number of ways. Personnel challenges remain a constant issue with declining populations, aging firefighters who are not being replaced with those of a younger generation, and a lack of tangible retention incentives. Yet with all these challenges, Fire departments are faced with higher call volumes than ever before, according to a study from the National Volunteer Fire Council. Most fire departments across the country have experienced a steady increase in calls over the past two decades. This is a major source of the increased time demands on volunteer firefighters. The number of calls coupled with the decline in the number of volunteer firefighters means that fire departments are continuously spread too thin. Most of the increase is attributed to a sharp rise in the number of emergency medical calls and false alarms and the use of mutual aid as, as uh, the size of the company uh, number of firefighters has decreased. Mr. Speaker, the dangerous work that these men and women do in order to protect the homes and livelihoods of Americans is not something that should be taken for granted. These first responders put their lives on the line and make great sacrifices in order to protect their neighbors and communities from harm. As a volunteer firefighter, EMT, rescue technician myself, and a member of the Congressional Fire Services Caucus, I'm grateful for the services that our first responders, those brothers and sisters that serve their communities provide in the constant state of readiness that they operate under. While we must not forget those that have made the ultimate sacrifice through their service, we must also ensure that their colleagues and all of our nation's first responders are respected and have the resources they need to safely perform their jobs. 
And that's why I'm working with the volunteer fire departments in Pennsylvania's 5th Congressional District to develop solutions, ideas to not only recruit more firefighters, but to retain them. It is my hope that by increasing awareness and examining incentives, we might be able to strengthen and grow the rosters of our volunteer fire departments. We know that this service is critical, and we must respect those who are willing to show up day or night to protect their neighbors. Thank you to all of our volunteers who answer when the alarm sounds. We value you, we respect you, and I hope we can find more of you to serve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I'm an American man born in Chicago to parents who were born citizens of the United States. The ban on legal immigration from seven countries does not impact me or my family directly. But as an American, I am speaking up today. I am an immigrant. The proposed roundup of millions of immigrants will not hit my house directly. But as an American, I'm standing up today to say I too am undocumented. I have not fled systematic persecution, but today, like a lot of Americans, I'm speaking out and saying clearly, I too am a refugee. Today, I'm an 81-year-old man originally from Iran who traveled to the United States with a heart problem, Mr. Speaker, a green card in my hand, and his American family, and he was detained at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. Today, I'm a Fulbright scholar who was put on a plane back to Iran because our government did not understand what the new president was doing, how they were doing it, or what people already traveling should do. Today, I'm a citizen of the United Kingdom, I'm English, with a green card, who was blocked entering at O'Hare with my U.S. citizen wife and my U.S. citizen child. That's who I am today. Today I'm a student in the middle of my academic career at the University of Chicago who does not know whether she can come back to school and continue her education. Today I'm one of more than 67,000 refugees already approved for travel and certified by both the United States and the UN in a painstaking process that took me years to complete, but I'm stranded overseas. Today I am gay or Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Shia or Sunni from a tribe or an ethnic group that is systematically targeted for persecution or living in a country anywhere in the world, that's who I am, that cannot protect my basic safety and the United States is closed to me. Today I'm an immigrant who has a green card and has followed all the rules to the letter, but I cannot renew my green card or lawfully apply for citizenship here in the U.S. because I'm from one of seven mostly Muslim countries on Trump's list, where incidentally there are no Trump hotels, buildings, or golf courses. But now the entire world knows that the President of the United States screwed up bigly last week and caused an international and domestic crisis, and that his staff are lying when they say it was a, quote, huge success. When the German chancellor, the German chancellor, has to lecture your president about the Geneva Convention, you have made one hell of a bad decision. When the Prime Minister of England is saying one day that the U.S. and Britain have a special relationship, but you're keeping her citizenship, her citizens, out of your country the very next day, when they are green card holders, your country has made a mistake. When Rudy Giuliani, of all people, makes it clear that the president requested a Muslim ban and they dressed up the policy to make it look better, but still carved out exceptions to Christians, you are probably acting in an unconstitutional manner. That is what not one, but two federal judges thought. And there are significant enough constitutional issues raised by recent executive actions to stop the president's order from being implemented. And honestly, even at this hour, I'm not sure they're fully complying with the orders or will reverse the action of government officers at airports who coerced, intimidated green card holders into signing away their rights and being deported. On Sunday, the glaring ball spot of the president's executive order was combed over by the Secretary of Homeland Security, 
who said keeping out travelers who already live in the U.S. and have green cards is not in the interest of the United States, to which the entire world said sarcastically, you think? Today, I am an American, I'm standing up. Today, I am one of the millions of Americans who went to airports, Trump hotels, or town squares, who are marching peacefully, praying privately, and preparing personally to act as advocates for immigrants and other families in our communities. Women, Jews, Gentiles, LGBT, and every one of every color and shape. Today, they did not come for us, but we could not be quiet. We joined arms and worked together as Americans. We pledged to stand up for those who are being targeted so that we can protect each other and stem the next wave of targeted attacks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, Texas has lost another one of our finest men in blue. Last month, Detective Jerry Walker responded to a call of a man brandishing a, a rifle and screaming and hollering in his backyard. So the officers arrived and they ordered the man to drop the weapon. <clears throat> but the outlaw did not comply and he ran into the house and started firing his weapon, shooting at the officers from inside the cover of his home. During the shootout with the officers, the outlaw was killed. But Detective Walker, a 48-year-old father of four and an 18-year veteran of the force, was shot during the shootout. This is a photograph of him. His fellow officers rushed Detective Walker, rushed to Detective Walker, and he was later airlifted to the hospital. But he died at the hospital. As his body was transported from the hospital, dozens of officers and emergency responders lined the street saluting their fallen detective. The song Amazing Grace could be heard on bagpipes as his body was taken away as it traveled down the street. Not only was Detective Walker an outstanding member of the Little Elm Police Department, he also wore another uniform. He, the, he wore the uniform of a soldier in the United States Army. Walker served our country both at home and abroad. Mr. Speaker, Little Elm is in North Texas. It has a population of about 3,500 people. It has 21 police officers, and Detective Walker was the longest serving officer in that town. Detective Walker's youngest child is only a few months old. His four children need to remember that their father died a servant of the people of Little Elm, Texas. He'll be remembered by his family, his friends, and his community as a model officer who really protected the innocent. But most importantly, he'll be remembered as someone who genuinely cared about the people of the community that he lived in. Before he became a detective with Little Elm Police Department, Walker served as a school resource officer at Little Elm High School. Students there remembered him as someone who could talk to the students and put them at ease. In fact, the kids just loved him. They often would arm wrestle with their beloved officer, officer during lunchtime. One such student, Lionel Valdez, met Walker at school about the same time Valdez started getting into trouble. Valdez's officer had walked out of his own life. So Walker took a parent's role, making sure that Valdez kept his nose clean and stayed out of trouble while he was in school. He even went so far as to make sure that he showed up in class. Years after Valdez graduated from high school, he would return to the school and have conversations with Walker, the one man that showed him the light during his darkest times as a student at school. Jerry Walker was a real-time hero. Detective Walker, Mr. Speaker, is the sixth officer killed in the line of duty in the first 17 days in 2017. Six deaths in 17 days is tragic. Our nation must honor those men and women who wear the badge, the badge of honor, sacrifice. Mr. Speaker, we must back the blue, back the blue, and back officers like Jerry Walker of Little Elm, Texas. 
and that's just the way it is. I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three centuries ago, Hans Christian Andersen wrote a fairy tale about a king who was so vain and insecure, nobody dared challenge him. Anderson wrote, quote, he cared nothing about reviewing his soldiers, going to the theater, or taking a ride in his carriage, except to show off his new clothes. Sound familiar? A leader so vain and insecure, those around him are afraid to challenge him. A man who thinks he's so smart, he can ignore intelligence briefings, and so powerful, he can attack an entire religion without respecting the Constitution, consulting Congress, or even his own cabinet. The White House claims their ban on Muslims entering our country is about, quote, keeping America safe. Don't be fooled. It's about keeping America scared. I'm not naive. There is good and evil in this world. My argument is that the administration has the two sides confused. Saturday, a five-year-old Maryland boy was held for hours at Dulles Airport while his frantic Iranian-born mother waited outside. Meanwhile, at 1600 Pennsylvania, alt-right provocateur Steve Bannon reassured the president that their extreme vetting was protecting us from evil. Okay, Mr. Bannon, let's talk extreme vetting. Before a refugee makes it to America, they're first vetted by the UN Commission for Refugees. Then the State Department investigates and interviews them overseas, checking them against databases with data from battlefields, email intercepts, intelligence, and other interviews. If they make it this far, and many do not, they are fingerprinted and investigated again by the FBI. This process can take up to two years and everyone is vetted. In fact, extremely vetted. But no extreme seems extreme enough for the extremists currently in the White House. And how did they choose the seven countries to target? In the past 40 years, there hasn't been a single terrorist act in America by someone from Syria, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, and Iraq. Of course, that's not all these countries have in common. They're also nations where the Trump Organization has no businesses. Meanwhile, the homes of every one of the 9-11 hijackers, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Lebanon, were left off the list. The Trump Organization has holdings in three out of the four. Last weekend at San Francisco International Airport, an Afghani interpreter for our military was detained, held, and questioned after risking his life for our country. In Chicago, Sahar al ghanami traveled from Syria to care for her dying mother. Despite having a valid visa, she was put back on a plane and sent home. Before she left, her sister said she was coerced to sign papers canceling her visa. Other detainees say they were asked their views on the current president. What does that have to do with anything? If having a negative view of the man in the White House is cause for getting kicked out of the country, we're going to lead and we're going to need a lot more planes. Since Friday, hundreds have been detained and thousands of legal residents and visa holders are in limbo overseas. ISIS is rejoicing and American troops and travelers are in danger. So how does the White House describe the results? Quote, a massive success story on every single level. If this is the Trump administration's idea of success, God help us when they fail. At the end of this famous story, Hans Christian Andersen's foolish emperor parades naked down the street, while those around him marvel at his magnificent clothes. Andersen wrote, no costume the emperor had worn before was ever such a complete success. Then a child cried out, but he hasn't got any clothes on. We all know how the story ends. Just like in the fairy tale, Sometimes it takes a child to show us the truth. I yield back. 
The gentlewoman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Taylor, for five minutes. I ask for unanimous consent to address the House for five minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to honor Chief Special Warfare Officer William Ryan Owens and his wife and his children. The Department of Defense has announced his death January 28th in the Arabian Peninsula after wounds sustained in a raid against Al-Qaeda. It should also be noted that two others were wounded on the raid and three others injured in a crash landing. I looked for my own words today, but I came across the profound writing of Andrew Stumpf. And I shall recite his powerful words today in honor of Chief Owens and his family. A debt that cannot be repaid. In a country that most would struggle to find on a map, in a compound that few possess the courage to enter, men from my previous life took the fight to our enemy. In that compound, they found men that pray five times a day for your destruction. Those men don't know me, they don't know you, and they don't know America. They don't understand our compassion, our freedoms, and our tolerance. I know it may seem as if those things are currently missing, but they remain, and I know they will return. Our capacity for them is boundless and is only dwarfed by their hatred for you. They do not care about your religious beliefs. They don't care about your political opinions. They don't care if you sit on the left or the right, liberal or conservative, pacifist or warrior. They don't care how much you believe in diversity, equality, or freedom of speech. I'm sorry that you never smelled the breath of a man who wants to kill you. I'm sorry that you never felt the alarm bells ringing in your body, the combination of fear and adrenaline as you move towards the fight instead of running from it. I'm sorry you have never heard someone cry out for help or cried out for help yourself, relying on the courage of others to bring you home. I'm sorry that you have never tasted the salt from your tears as you stand at flag-draped coffins, burying men you were humbled to call your friends. I do not wish those experiences on you, but I wish you had them. It would change the way you act. It would change the way you value. It would change the way you appreciate. You become quick to open your eyes and slow to open your mouth. Most will never understand the sacrifice required to keep men from that compound away from your doorstep. But it would not hurt you to try. It would not hurt you to take a moment to respect the sacrifices that others make on your behalf, whether they share your opinions or not. It would not hurt you to take a moment to think of the relentless strain on family on friends and loved ones that are left behind. Ideas not protected by words. Paper may outline the foundation and the principles of this nation, but it is blood that protects it. In that compound, a man that you have never met gave everything he had so that you have the freedom to think, speak, and act however you choose. He went there for all of us, whether you loved him or you hated what he stood for. He went there to preserve the opportunity and the privilege to believe, to be, and to become what we want. In this country, every single person living inside its borders under the banner of its flag owe that man. We owe that man everything. We owe him the respect that his sacrifice deserves. Saying thank you is not enough. We send our best and lose them in the fight against the worst this world has to offer. If you want to respect and honor their sacrifice, it needs to be more than words. You have to live it. Take a minute and look around. Soak it in. All of it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You have the choice every day as to which category you want to be in, and which direction you want to move. You have that choice because the best among us, 
the best we have ever had to offer, fought, bled, and died for it. Don't ever forget it. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on Friday, I visited a community health center in Worcester, Massachusetts. There, at a place dedicated to healing those in their community, I met one of their patients. It was a 42-year-old Muslim refugee from Baghdad who arrived in the United States this past November. He, his wife, and his children spent three years in a Turkish refugee camp fleeing their home country. His family had been targeted in Iraq. He had been hospitalized four times with bombing injuries. He and his wife had both been shot. He watched his own brother burn to, that, to, that, to death in his front of his eyes. And countless members of his family are still missing. He was a musician back home. And he struggled to keep up his craft as he has fled. A doctor in that health center managed to track down a used trumpet and presented it to that man as a gift. Now, every time he visits that health center, he brings the trumpet and plays it for the staff. My visit was no exception. He stood in front of our group and proudly played our national anthem with tears in his eyes. Because this country had given him a home. This country is helping him mend his wounds, has protected his family, and has given him a chance to fight another day. It is a badge of honor that he shares with every single person living in our great nation, regardless of color or creed, that we are all bound together by the immense opportunity of those golden doors, opened at one point for our own families sometime down the road. Hours after our visit, our president, his president, told him that his relatives, his neighbors, and millions of others who have suffered just as he has were no longer welcome here. To Samira Askari, a 30-year-old doctor traveling to Boston to study cures for tuberculosis, he closed the doors. To the Iraqi general who commands American trade trained counter-terrorist force traveling here to visit his relocated family, our president closed our doors. To all of the 21.3 million refugees worldwide, the leader of our free world told them that their pain and their suffering was not his problem, and he closed our doors. And to the global community, he made clear that his government will give in to terror and will make decisions based on fear rather than strength. Mr. President, I hope you hear us loud and clear when we say that these actions are an insult to the country we all love. They are an insult to our Constitution and an embarrassment to the blood, the sweat, and the tears that generations of Americans have shed in defense of labor, Lady Liberty. And so, Mr. President, we will fight, we will march, we will protest, we will raise our voices, and one day we will win. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Members are reminded to direct their comments to the chair and not a perceived viewing audience. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I've had the privilege of working with Republican and Democratic presidents. And I might add that I've had the sadness to be standing with them during times of needs of this nation. Let me acknowledge during my tenure, President George W. Bush, who was president during 9-11. I was in this Capitol on September 9th, uh, September 11th, 2001. And so I was physically evacuated as we were leaving with 
no understanding of what was happening, particularly for those of us who had come for early morning meetings, not having the full impact of what had happened in New York, and not having the full impact, but as we were leaving, I might say fleeing this building, we took a look to our right. We could see the billowing black smoke in the Pentagon. We were running for our lives. We we're running as Americans, Muslims, Jews, Christians, people of many faith, many races, many genders, many orientations. We we're running as Americans. I imagine those families at Ground Zero were also, as they watched in horror or heard in horror of their loved ones lost in spite of the heroic efforts of first responders, first responders lost, there too was a multitude of the United Nations. This nation has always welcomed and respected people from all over the world. And so it disturbs me when those of us who have now taken a visible and stoic stand against an unconstitutional executive order that we begin to receive attacks from the very person who should be bringing this nation together. I take great insult from the firing of Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates, a person who I have worked with personally as a member, senior member of the House Judiciary Committee. She is a profound integrity, honesty, respectability, and professionalism. Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates, I congratulate you for being a patriot. And so last evening, she rendered this statement. In addition, I am responsible for ensuring that the positions we take in court remain consistent with this institution's solemn obligation to always seek justice and to stand for what is right. At present, I am not convinced that the defense of the executive order, and this is by the White House, banning Muslims is consistent with these responsibilities, nor am I convinced that the executive order is lawful. Responding to that, almost like Nixon some decades ago, this White House fired Attorney General Yates and proceeded to make this statement. The acting Attorney General Sally Yates has betrayed the Department of Justice by refusing to enforce legal orders designed to protect the citizens of the United States. This order was approved as to form and legality by the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. Sally Yates explained it. But there's no betrayal of the Department of Justice. It is an entity. It is not the American people, and it's not the Constitution. She has no obligation to the Department of Justice. She has an obligation to the American people to uphold the Constitution. The White House proceeds to go on to say, I assume President Trump, Ms. Yates is an Obama administration appointee who is weak on borders and very weak on illegal immigration, of which I don't know their proof of such. But what I will say to you is that she was doing her civic and uh, patriotic duty by remaining there as a senior member who is the only person there that could sign subpoenas. She was doing America a favor. And so I will say in the backdrop of that, were you at the airport as I was at the Bush Intercontinental Airport when an Iraqi citizen came in, a legal permanent resident with a green card, and was retained, detained for five hours while his employee and lawyers were gathering and hovering outside and CBP, to my understanding how frightened they were, how they did not know what was going on, did not allow them to be able uh, to speak. Or did you listen last night when an Iraqi woman indicated that her husband was murdered and she hid for 12 years? in Iraq until she was able to bring her children here? Did you hear that refugees are being denied to come in for 120 days on Friday, Mr. Speaker, and that their papers will expire? And finally, Mr. Speaker, did you hear that the paper trader in Quebec had on his social media that he was supporting or praising President Trump? Enough is enough. Repeal this order. Pass the Solve Act. Pass the USA Act that I've introduced as well. That Gentlewoman's time has religion. expired. Stop this madness. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your kindness. I yield back.
The executive order is unconstitutional. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell, for five minutes. America is and must remain a country that welcomes refugees. And we must welcome refugees of all religions. President Trump has our country under a Muslim ban. A Muslim ban that makes us less safe and less American. Less safe because we already have in place since World War II a process for vetting refugees who come to this country. An intense process that takes 18 to 24 months before anyone can get here. Less safe because it makes us less of a team player on an international stage that requires cooperation among our allies and those in the Middle East who are helping us fight terrorism. If we are not taking on refugees as our allies, like Jordan and Germany and others who are in the thick of this fight, we will not be seen as a team player and we will not be able to count on them for cooperation. Less safe because it motivates and inspires an enemy who is determined to dispel a message that the United States is not welcome to Muslims. It makes us less American because refugees have helped America as much as America has helped refugees. We've seen this in the wisdom of Albert Einstein, the patriotism of Secretary Madeleine Albright. I've seen this in my own congressional office with my chief of staff, Ricky Lee, who came to our country at age four on a raft fleeing Vietnam and was welcomed into this country where he was given an opportunity to be the first in his family to go to college, started working on Capitol Hill as an intern, and serves as a chief of staff in my office today. I've seen this spirit of the refugee in Mohammed Yousafi, who was my guest at the State of the Union just two years ago. Mohammed served our country as an interpreter in Afghanistan lost his father who was kidnapped and killed by the Taliban for his service, had his little brother kidnapped, and he gave his life savings to save his brother's life. We brought Muhammad over to the United States, but today, if Muhammad was on his way to the United States under this Muslim ban, he'd be detained in an airport. But what is American? American is standing up and welcoming people in need. Being American means going to an airport as I saw thousands do when I went to SFO Airport in San Francisco this weekend. I saw the lawyers on our staff working to provide casework to anyone who was detained. I saw the spirit of generosity across our country at airports and town squares. Being an American means supporting Congresswoman Lofgren's SOLVE Act, the Statue of Liberty Values Act, that will fix and end this Muslim ban. Being an American is what Sally Yates did last night when she stood up against an illegal order and she was fired. Acting Attorney General Sally Yates was not the person who deserved to be fired yesterday. To stop this Muslim ban, we must unite in this country. Unite and make sure that we are safe and welcoming to those in need. Unite to say we will not target people for persecution based on religion. Unite to live out indeed what we are taught in the Bible. Luke chapter 10 verse 25 a student asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, love the Lord with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The student asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him the story of a traveler from Jerusalem headed to Jericho who was attacked, robbed, and beaten along his journey and stripped of all of his clothes. He encounters a priest who walks to the other side of the road when he sees the traveler. He encounters a Levite, who also, like the priest, walks to the other side of the road when he sees this beaten, weary traveler. But then he comes across a Samaritan. The Samaritan took pity on the traveler, bandaged his wounds, and took him and paid for him to stay at an inn. Jesus asked the student, which of these men was a neighbor? The student said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to the student, go and do likewise. To my colleagues in this house, Republicans and Democrats, and Americans across this great land, refugees are our neighbors. They are the weary travelers. How will we receive them? The American spirit is to be like the Samaritan. 
we must go and do likewise. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor a Minnesota public servant. After nearly a decade, after nearly a decade of, of service to his community, my friend and St. Michael's mayor, former mayor, Jerry Zachman, I, I want to congratulate him on his retirement. Jerry has deep roots in St. Michael, as he is a part of the fifth generation of his family to live there. And these strong ties to his beloved community no doubt inspired Jerry to serve. As the community began to grow and develop, his main goal was to ensure that St. Michael residents were always put first. I think, that's, I think it's safe to say that Jerry did just that. During his 10 years as mayor, Jerry made numerous improvements to this ever-growing community and city. One major project Jerry played a huge role in is the expansion of the I-94 corridor, which cuts through Minnesota's 6th Congressional District. I want to thank Jerry for his unwavering dedication to St. Michael and to our great state, and I wish him nothing but the best in his future. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate an athlete from my district who has persevered and conquered, achieved despite challenges that have been presented to him during his life. This past week, snowmobile motocross racer Mike Schultz from St. Cloud, Minnesota won his sixth gold medal at the Winter X Games. Mike lost his left leg during a tragic accident in 2008. This past uh, week, he competed amongst opponents who were also amputees or partially paralyzed. Mike Schultz serves as a wonderful reminder of what can be accomplished when one never gives up and displays courage in the face of extreme challenge. It is inspiring to see a young man come out on top against such adversity. We are proud of you, Mike, and I look forward to watching you compete in the 2017 International Paralympic Committee World Para Snowboard Championships in Canada later this year. I have no doubt you will, you will be victorious once again. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate one of the great leaders in Minnesota. Stanley S. Hubbard, the president and chairman of Hubbard Broadcasting, has been awarded the First Amendment Leadership Award from the Radio Television Digital News Foundation. Hubbard Broadcasting owns several media outlets, including KSTP, a local news affiliate in the great state of Minnesota. Stan Hubbard is well known in his industry. In fact, he has already been inducted into the Broadcast and Cable Hall of Fame, and he has received the Distinguished Service Award from the National Association of Broadcasters. The First Amendment Leadership Award is presented annually to a business or government leader who has made a significant contribution to the protection of the First Amendment and the freedom of the press. This award was made for someone like Stan Hubbard. Stan Hubbard of Hubbard Broadcasting has spent his entire career in the media protecting and promoting free speech and a free and accountable press. Congratulations to you, Stan, and to the entire Hubbard Broadcasting family. You deserve this award because you earn it every day. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, today I rise to place uh, in the record a very important story from the Columbus, Ohio Dispatch newspaper. It focuses on Steve Mnuchin, President Trump's nominee to be Treasury Secretary, and it raises issues of deep concern. According to the Dispatch, Mnuchin was untruthful to the Senate Finance Committee regarding his company's aggressive role in hastening thousands of home foreclosures during the 2000 financial crisis and what followed, and his misdeeds deeply impacted places like Ohio. Mr. Mnuchin was the chief executive officer of One West, which engaged in so-called robo-signing of mortgage documents. That means you really don't, you treat people like objects, you really don't go into the details of every case. The dispatch said its analysis of dozens of foreclosure cases in Ohio uh, and um, 
subsequent action prove otherwise. The dastardly practice of robo-signing, prevalent throughout the mortgage industry in the aftermath of that terrible financial crisis, had certain leaders, of which Mr. Mnuchin was at the top of the heap, and their employees signed foreclosure documents en masse without properly reviewing them and forcing unjust foreclosures. The dispatch found more than 1,900 such cases in Ohio alone. Individual cases reveal One West declared properties vacant even though someone was living in them. One West time and again refused to abide by agreed upon loan modifications. Is that the kind of person that we really want in charge of the U.S. Treasury Department? Nominee Mnuchin comes with a Goldman Sachs pedigree. Well, wouldn't we know that? He was nicknamed the foreclosure king the foreclosure king, after buying up IndyMac, a subprime lender that evicted about 36,000 people during the financial crisis. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, while President-elect Trump promised to drain the swamp, his nominee for Treasury Secretary proves he's not doing that at all. He's enlarging the swamp. The dispatch found more than 1,900, I repeat, one West foreclosures in our state's six largest counties from 2009 to 2015. In addition, uh, Mr. Mnuchin profited profited personally off of kicking people out of their homes. Does such a person actually deserve confirmation as Secretary of the Treasury of the United States of America? Wake up, America. Wake up. Pay attention to what's happening here in Washington, D.C. This city belongs to you. This capital belongs to you. I would also like to place on the record a a release I sent out uh, over the weekend relating to President Trump's executive order on immigration and refugees. And I just wish to say that the ancestors of the Trump family as well as the Captor family passed through the unforgettable portal of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. And the words at the base of that statue are emblazoned in the mind of families like our own going back generations. Give me your tired your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Surely, President Trump has read these words. I support robust efforts to make America safe and secure and have served on all the committees in this Congress that aim to do that. But workable solutions should ensure America's safety without destroying our heritage as an immigrant nation dedicated to liberty and justice for all. President Trump's mandate actually will make America less safe because it penalizes worthy individual and puts them at greater risk and actually gives terrorist cells ammunition to use against America. Think about it. This mandate puts people at risk who have helped America in our battle against terrorism abroad and at home and it punishes innocent individuals caught in the crossfire fleeing terror and tribal conflict. Dangerously, this misconceived executive order will spur any American sentiment globally and on the internet, spurring more terrorism. The old World War II motto, loose lips sink ships, is going to happen because of the way this was conducted. Reckless rhetoric puts our nation at greater risk at home and puts Americans fighting for us and those traveling abroad in greater danger. Mr. Speaker, I cordially invite the President to Northern Ohio. Come and meet some of the people whose lives your order affected. I think you'll change your mind. I yield back my remaining time. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentlewoman's statement will appear in the record. Members are reminded to address their remarks to the chair. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing from coast to coast demonstrations, protests, people speaking out against the outrageous, reckless, and cruel executive order promulgated this by the administration on Friday. It's wrong, it's immoral on so many levels. It's hard to know where to stop.
I just left my office where the president of Western States Chiropractic College, the largest such institution in the country, Joe Brimhall, was here. He has a number of students who are dual citizens, uh, who need to leave the United States to take their board certified tests next week in Canada. He doesn't know what to tell them. Pursue their professional career and maybe not be able to come back to the United States and finish uh, at the college. It's embarrassing that we can't give him guidance and that we have this ill thought out reckless executive order that wasn't planned and still is having the details worked out. But perhaps the worst aspect of this blanket cancellation is as it affects special immigrant visas for Iraqis who are waiting to come to the United States. Whatever you think about the Iraq war, the men and women in Iraq who volunteered to help our forces were essential. They were guides. They were interpreters. They worked on the projects. We could not have done the job over there without them. In many cases, they blended into the units with which they served. I've had cases where people describe to me, soldiers, how these people literally saved their lives. I've heard from veterans who cared deeply and wonder about the signal that they're sending to people they regarded essentially as family. They wonder how this administration could have forgotten about them. The guard in my office in Portland, who's a veteran, was asking me what's going on. He recalled his story about an interpreter that was critical to him when he served in Iraq. How could we have forgotten them? Well, I'll tell you, somebody who's not forgotten them are the, the Taliban, the ISIS terrorists, who regard these people as traitors, who have long memories, who want to make these people pay for helping the United States. We've seen countless examples of these people being hunted down by terrorists. They've been assaulted, they've been kidnapped, they've had family members held for ransom, they've been murdered. That's why I've worked on a bipartisan basis for 10 years establishing the Special Immigrant Visa Program with the late Senator Kennedy, with John McCain, Senator Shaheen, my Republican colleague Adam Kinzinger, Congressman Stivers and Hunter, who were veterans themselves and understood why this program was important. There's a lot of talk about extreme venting. Trust me. The applicants for these visas are extremely vetted, taking two and three years, sometimes longer, fighting for the bureaucracy, trying to make sure that they can escape to safely. Many have been killed because the extreme vetting process took so long. And now, to turn their lives upside down and put them at risk because there are people in the White House who don't understand or who don't care is appalling. I applaud my colleagues in both parties who are speaking out and asking the administration to come to its senses on this blanket ban of Muslims from seven countries. Seven countries, by the way, that have not been involved with terrorist acts. This is not going to make us any safer. Some have speculated that some of the countries that have been left out, like Saudi Arabia, where most of the 9-11 terrorists came from, were left out because the president has business interests there. I don't know why these items were selected, but the fact is it should end today. And it should end not just because of the, the brave men and women under the special immigrant visa program from Iraq whose lives are now at greater risk because of this reckless act. It's wrong because of the signals we are sending to foreign nationals who we rely upon. It's not just in Iraq. We have people who work for the United States, who live in other countries, who help us with the State Department, with the military. What message are we sending to them if the United States is not going to stand up and protect them? 
gentleman's time has expired. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until noon today. <laughs>